Amen. I don't ever get tired of talking about the greatness of God. You know that we serve a perfect Savior. Uh, when we were singing with the um, congregation earlier, when Wes and Ed were playing and singing, and that song that we sang about the vilest offender. You know who the vilest offender is? That's the person that I see when I look in the mirror. And just this morning, I looked into the mirror, checking the lines, checking the wrinkles, checking the gray hairs, the white hairs, and thinking about the passing of time and remembering almost 34 years back that God's grace was great enough to save a wretch like me. And I don't say that from any sort of humble perspective or anything of that nature. In, in my walk with the Lord, I have tried and failed so many times. I could write a book about trying and failing. But let me tell you something. But God, those two words are two of the greatest words you'll ever see in your King James Bible. But God, but God stepped in and met me where he found me. I didn't find God, he found me. <laughs> he wasn't lost, I was lost. And you know why I love to sing these old songs and these old hymns? Because in every single one of those songs, and I haven't come across one yet that didn't have scripture either directly or indirectly, and the name of Jesus is so high and lifted up, and, and, and you can't make too much of Jesus Christ. And this doesn't have a whole lot to do with my message today, but this is why um, singing and music is so very important. You know where the first musicians came from? Lucifer was the first one to play and sing, and he led the choir of God. And it's the descendants of Cain who made all the musical instruments. And so you got to be careful with music. you got to really know what you're doing when it comes to music, because all music is designed to motivate you in some direction somewhere. If you open up the history books and you see the Revolutionary War, the little fife and the drummer boy, right? And they're playing the drums and they're blowing the trumpets. You know what they're trying to do? They're trying to get the men motivated to go fight and die for the cause. All music motivates you somewhere, someplace to do something. And most music in Sunday school this morning, Brother Ed was talking about this world system. Um, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That's the people. That's me and you. That's the souls, the descendants of Adam and Eve. That's what God loved. This world system God's going to blow it to pieces. 2 Peter chapter 3, Revelation chapter 20. That's what's going to happen to this world system. So, my message today is found in Psalms chapter 90. And let's take a look at verses... Um, let's start in verse 9. Psalm chapter 90, we're going to go from... Um, verses 9 through 12. For all our days are passed away in thy wrath. We spend our years as a tale that is told. For the days of our years are threescore years and ten. And if by reason of strength they be fourscore years, yet is their strength, labor, and sorrow. For it is soon cut off and we fly away. Who knoweth the power of thine anger? Even according to thy fear, so is thy wrath. And this is my text for this morning. So teach us to number our days that we may apply our hearts unto wisdom. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for the word that was taught in Sunday school this morning, uh, for the word that was sung, uh, for the giving that was done. And now, Lord, um, uh, be with me as I open up the scriptures and preach your word and let it be a blessing to the people. And we just thank you and praise you, God, in Jesus' name. Amen. Psalm 90, verse 12. So teach us to number our days that we may apply our hearts unto wisdom. I've said many times that our public school system doesn't really teach students anything that they need to know to be a success in life. There's an agenda in that public school system. There always has been. There always will be. 
what students need to know and what children need to be taught. The Bible says, train up a child in the way that he should go. When he is young and when he is old, he will not depart from it. But what we should be teaching children is the wisdom of God. Because there's two types of wisdom in this world. There's the wisdom that comes from below, and that's the wisdom that comes from Satan. All right. And there is the wisdom that comes from God. Now, turn to Ezekiel chapter 38, uh, 28. Ezekiel chapter 28. And there are two types of wisdom in this world. The one type of wisdom says, eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die. That's worldly wisdom. That's the devil's wisdom. Uh, God's wisdom is, teach us to number our days so that we know how much time that we have left. Um, Ezekiel chapter 28, and look at what it says about Lucifer. Ezekiel 28, verse 12, Son of man, take up a lamentation upon the king of Tyrus, and say unto him, Thus saith the Lord God, Thou sealest up the sum, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. Uh, This world, as and we went over this in Sunday school, it's amazing to me how oftentimes the things that God puts on my heart to talk about in the message, the same things that God puts on Brother Ed's heart to talk about in the Sunday school. And there is... um, the lust of the eyes and the lust of the flesh and the pride of life and all those things are presented to us each and every day like shiny little ornaments on a Christmas tree. And that is the wisdom of the world. That is the wisdom of Satan. But what we need to have is we need to have the wisdom of God. Now, let's go back to Psalm chapter 90. And I want to show you something. It's a tiny little thing, but it just... uh, When I see things like this, it just reminds me that you can never put too much faith in your King James Bible. Um, Psalm 90, verse 10. The days of our years are threescore years and ten. That's 70 years. And then he says, and if by reason of strength, if you do really good, you avoid the landmines, you eat your broccoli, you take your vitamins, you know... (laughs) You don't drink, you don't smoke, you don't stay out late. If by reason of strength, you can get all the way to four score years, which is 80 years. Now, that's a bold claim for the Bible to make, that man's days are going to be 70 to 80 years, right? This was written thousands of years ago. How much of our world has changed in technology and advances in science and medicine and all this great stuff that man has created. Here is a census figure from 2022, the last time that they compiled the figures. The life expectancy at birth for men was 74.8 years, and for women, it was 80.2. Here we are, 6,000 years of human history. The Bible says this in Psalms chapter 90, that the days of our years are 70 years, 80 tops. There will be exceptions. There's always exceptions to every rule. But the vast majority of people will live between the ages of 70 and 80. And you just can't beat. And that's exactly what your King James Bible says. You're going to live to be 70 to 80 years old. My mom died when she was 68. My dad died when he was 77. My mom was just under 70. My dad was just under 80. Uh, There's just no getting around it. Um, Did you know that time, Ephesians 5.16 says that we are to be redeeming the time because the days are evil. And what does the Bible mean by evil days? It means that there is a clock that is ticking from the moment that you're born. You're not growing, you're dying. And there is a set number of hours and minutes and seconds to however long that you're going to live your life. And Ephesians 5.16 says, you need to redeem that time because the days are evil, the days are against you. If you were going to go buy a flat screen TV or you're going to go trade your car in, or if you're going to buy a new house, 
At some point, don't you think that you would go to your bank account and see how much money that you had to see if you could make that purchase? Isn't that like a logical thing that most people do? If I want to go out after church today and buy something that costs $350, I can guarantee you, unless I'm putting it on a credit card, but if I'm actually going to pay for it, I'm going to go check my balance to see if I can spend that much money because that balance changes. Time is the only currency, and the Bible talks a lot about spending time. That's what you do with money. You spend money. Time is the only currency that we have that we use that we don't know what the available balance is. We don't know how much time that we have left. And when we first started the street preaching in downtown St. Augustine, um, people used to say to me, well, maybe I'll come out with you, maybe I won't, but I'll tell you this, if things get bad, I'll come out and I'll join you guys out in the streets. If I know that the rapture is going to happen, I'll dump it all and I'll come join you out on the streets. That's assuming that you know how much time that there is left and how much time that you have left personally. Um, a man who used to come to this church, Mark Bennett, and I've, I talk about him from time to time because he was a good friend of mine. And um, he came out and he went street preaching with us and he joined us for a number of years. And then back in 2020, 2021, he just showed up one day at my studio, just kind of out of the blue. And he said, hey, this is great. God's expanding your ministry. I'm going to pray for your brother. Gave me a big hug. And if you knew Mark, <laughs> a big hug from Mark, you had no idea where you were. The lights were out, you know, 380 pounds, 300, 400 on a good day. Um, and I always thought to myself, that's the strangest thing. It was great to see him, but it's almost like, why was he here? It, it was like in Acts chapter um, uh, 8, where the Spirit just takes Philip and just transports him. I, I just turned around, and there he was. I didn't even hear the door opened. It's like he was transported there. What I didn't know, and what he didn't know, is that in a few months, he would be dead. And he died of COVID. And um, if you were friends with him on Facebook, he real-timed the whole thing. It took five days. He checked in, I think, on a Monday. And by Friday, he was upside down in a medical coma in the ICU on a ventilator. And then sometime between Friday and Saturday, the Lord took him home and he died. Now, he was a lot younger than I am. And we have a tendency to think, well, you know, you got the gray hair now, you got the white hair now, you've, you've, you've hit the big 5-0, and then you hit the big 6-0. I can remember years ago li listening to Dr. Ruckman preach, and he was probably 84, 85 at the time, and he said, oh, to be 60 again. And when I heard him say that, I was probably in my early 40s, and it really made me laugh. I'm thinking... Oh, to be 60 again. Um, but then you pass 60, and then you start looking towards 70, and the ladder gets really, really narrow. It's kind of like going up the steps. Uh, raise your hand if you've ever been to the top of the lighthouse in St. Augustine. 219 steps from top to bottom. And you know what the funny thing is about the lighthouse? Is that when you start down at the bottom, everybody's smiling everybody's laughing and joking nobody's out of breath it's a beautiful day it's saint augustine you probably just came from osteen's and had fried shrimp and you're feeling good and so you start walking up these steps and everybody's smiling everybody's happy you get past the middle and almost without you being aware of it it begins to constrict and it begins to get narrow and then by the time you get to the last 10 or 15 steps, you're literally doing this in almost a very tight circle because that's how narrow the steps are at the top. Everything is getting cut off and then you get to the top and you step out and it's the pre-trib rapture of the church and you're with the Lord. But what a great metaphor and illustration that that is for life. Everybody starts out as a happy, smiling baby 
I was not so, so much of a happy baby. I, I was in a wheelchair for two and a half years. I had pyloric stenosis, an operation that just a generation before I had it, they just let the baby die. They had no way to solve that. It's snip, snip now. It's a, you know, you're in and out in a couple of hours. But back in 1961, the head of the hospital performed the surgery personally. That's how new that it was. And, but most babies are fat and happy and giggling and smiling. And the steps at the bottom are very, very wide and everybody has easy passage. But as the decades begin to tick off, those steps get more narrow. They get closer together. The distance gets shorter and shorter. And you are just a heartbeat away from eternity at that point. Now, with that in mind, let's go back and just read these four verses. Psalm 90, verse 9, For all our days are passed away in thy wrath. We spend our years as a tale that is told. I don't know if you saw Netflix the other night on Friday night. And uh, a man, you may have heard his name, Mike Tyson, had a boxing match with Jake Paul. He's a YouTuber, multimillionaire. Um, and and um, there was a lot of hype going into this fight. And when you get to the end of the fight, everybody is dismally disappointed. Nobody on either side is happy. Half the people think it was a scam and Tyson took a dive. The other half of the people think that Jake Paul paid off or whatever the case was. But when I looked at Mike Tyson sitting in the, the stool between the rounds, I saw in his eyes the look of somebody whose bank account of time had ran dry and he didn't even know that he had nothing left in the bank. And everybody he spoke to reminded him of the former days and the glory days when he was the world's youngest heavyweight boxing champ. And people were so scared to fight him that many fights were won because the other person got a look at him and didn't really want to fight. And they just kind of let themselves take a few shots to get out of that fight quickly because they knew that they couldn't win. He was a fearsome person. Friday night, it was one outlet said it was a dreary and dismal spectacle for the ages. And you know what happens as Christians? We don't realize that we have a bank account whose currency is time. And we don't ever bother to check what the available balance is. Now, you might say to me, well, if that's the metaphor that you're using, how can anybody check the balance of their time? Well, I'm glad you asked. James 4.14. Turn to James 4.14. I understand that the book of James is written to Jews in the tribulation, dispensationally, um, here at Bethany Baptist, we always talk about rightly dividing. We always talk about dispensational truth. We always talk about 2 Timothy 2.15. So I get all that. Um, but the whole Bible is written for our learning and our ad admonition. There's no place in this Bible that you can go to that you can't get something that you can apply to your life here and now living in the church age. And James 4.14 is one of those places. Actually, James 4.13. James says, Go to now, ye that say, Today or tomorrow we will go into such a city and continue there a year and buy and sell and get great gain. Whereas ye know not what shall be on the morrow. For what is your life? It is even a vapor that appeareth for a little time and then vanisheth away. For that ye ought to say that if the Lord will, we shall live, do this or that. But now ye rejoice in your boastings, all such rejoicing is evil. What is James saying? You're bragging about something that's going to take place in the future and you don't know what that future holds, but God does. And so the idea, the way that you can check the available balance in your bank account 
of the time that you have left. Proverbs chapter 3, verses um, 5 through 8. Turn to Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 through 8. A lot of the times, we only read Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 and 6, and we stop there. But the wisdom keeps going. Proverbs chapter 3, verse 5. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart, and lean not into thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. Be not wise in thine own eyes. Fear the Lord and depart from evil. It shall be health to thy navel and marrow to thy bones. Um, this is what Solomon is saying, that if you're going to follow the Lord, you don't know what tomorrow holds, but, you, but he knows what tomorrow holds. He has seen the end of each and every one of us. It has already taken place. It has already come to pass. God has already seen it. It has already happened. Have you ever thought about the book of Revelation? Have you ever thought about the things that John was shown by the Lord Jesus? What was he shown? He was shown the future. Right? Is it going to happen exactly the way that Revelation says that it's going to happen? Yes. Every jot, every tittle, every word, every letter, every verse, every sentence. You have church age, chapters 1 through 4, and then 4-1 is the rapture of the church, and then all the way to 19, you have the time of Jacob's trouble. In 19, you have the marriage of the Lamb, you have Armageddon at the second coming, and then 20 um, is the millennium, and then 21 and 22 is eternity. Are all those things going to take place exactly the way that the Bible says that they will? Yes. John has already seen them. They took place 2,000 years ago. They haven't happened yet. But God is the one that knows the end from the beginning. And it's not a hypothetical guess on his part. He has already seen the end of each and every one of us. Just like when you were born, God had already seen the day that the gospel would be given to you in some way, in some measure, in some form. He saw that day that you got saved and you were predestinated to be put into the body of Christ based on your belief of the gospel. That's what was predestinated. Not the people. The plan was predestinated. So, if Ephesians chapter 1 says that God works everything out according to the counsel of his own will. You think he's pretty smart? You think he knows what's going on? And so every place that we look in the Bible talking about our length of days and how, many, how much time we have left and how we should be spending that time was written by somebody who has already seen the end of it. And he is saying, look, this, these are the crib notes, right? This is the salvation for dummies, and we're all dummies, right? And he says, look, I'm going to show you the end of the lost person. I'm going to show you the end of the saved person. I'm going to show you what happens when the lost person does good deeds. They don't count for anything. And I'm going to show you how when the saved person backslides, I convict him and get him back on the track. And I'm going to show you each and every nugget of information that you need to know to live this life that you find yourself in. Now, raise your hand if you volunteered to be born. <laughs> Amen, brother. We open up our eyes and we're here and we're screaming and we're crying. That's how this life starts. And if you look at it, in total from 40,000 feet, like you're flying an airplane, it is a veil of tears. Uh, my older brother, we prayed for him back in January and um, God gave him a miracle healing. Now he has a mass in his throat. They've had this big operation and we're waiting for the results of the biopsy. Um, the doctors say they're not overly hopeful 
uh, please keep him on your prayer list if you could. Um, but I can remember a day when me and my four brothers were young and strong and had heads full of hair, right? And the world seemed to just open itself up before us, beckon to us, and we could make anything that we wanted out of our lives. And well, now here we are, I wouldn't say at the end, but we're on the other side of the pendulum now. My mom's gone, my dad's gone, my one brother died back in um, 1988, and uh, praying and hoping that my other brother gets a healing. But this is what, the longer that you live, this is what we see. And so as Christians, as born-again, Bible-believing Christians, this message I have today is not a depressing message. This message today, hopefully by the time we get to the end of it, it's going to be an uplifting and motivational message of hope. But the clock is ticking. Remember that soap opera, The Days of Our Lives, and when that show back in the 1950s, uh, before I was born, but I've seen the opening to that program, this black and white picture of a, uh, um, an hourglass and this very dystopian voice um, as sand through the hourglass, so goes the days of our lives. That's a Bible truth. They weren't preaching it from the Bible, but that's a Bible truth truth. And when the last grain of sand has dropped through that hourglass, you'll be wherever your destination has taken you to. So let's talk about that for a moment. 1 Corinthians 15. For over a century and a half, we have seen in America and around the world, we have seen an amazing amount of technology take place. You know what we saw on YouTube last night, most amazing thing. If you had a guess when the first sound recording was, now we have streaming media and you back it up to CDs, you back it up to cassette players, you back it up to 33 and a third records, you back it up to 78 records, you back it up to um, wax cylinders and tinfoil rolls, which would have been about 1889, 1895, that time period. If you had a guess, how far back do you think the first recorded, intentionally recorded sound was? If you, 1890, 1880, 1860. That, and they recorded it with a needle somebody speaking in a, tu in a tub, the sound was filtered through a membrane and a rotating piece of paper that was covered in the dust from an oil lamp and that needle scratched as that person spoke. They had no idea that that could be played. And they made those, I don't even want to call them recordings because they didn't know that that was being recorded. But they did that so they could see what sound waves looked like. And then you get into the 20th century, you get into the 21st century, somebody finds those pieces of paper, they say, hey, let's see if we can hear a voice. And they work their magic, scientists figured it out for many, many months, and that those pieces of paper with those scratchy lines from 1860, produce the sound of a middle-aged man singing the song, Claire de Lune. Now, isn't that an amazing... We saw this last night. Isn't that an amazing thing? That's the world that we live in. We feel Al Capone died of syphilis, one of the most well-known gangsters of all time. He died of syphilis, and it you could see it popping out on his face. He couldn't think right, he got dementia, and he died a very slow and painful death from something that if somebody gets syphilis in 2024, all you have to do is go to the doctor, get one antibiotic, 
and it's gone in 24 hours. We live in a world that has unbelievable advanced technology. Some would say alien technology. Now, all that technology and all those advances and figuring out all those diseases, guess how many people science has kept from dying? <laughs> Zero. Death has a unbroken record. Father time has an unbroken record. 1 Corinthians 15, 22, Paul gives us the clue. He says this, For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. Somebody once said that if you're born once, you die twice. If you're born twice, you die once. The reason why... When I first got saved and I read John chapter 3, I got saved on John 3.16, but then I started to read the rest of it. And Jesus says, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, ye must be born again. And that is a phrase that, that when I got saved, nobody could explain that to me, what that meant to be born again. Um, look in Genesis chapter 5. The reason why... You have to be born again to enter into the kingdom of God is because your first birth was no good. Genesis chapter 5, verse 3. And Adam lived in 130 years and begat a son in his own likeness after his image and called his name Seth. You and I, when we were born, we were born in the image and likeness of a man who was cursed, a woman who was cursed, and we eat food from off the ground that was cursed. If you're a carnivore, if you're on the carnivore diet, and you're avoiding all plants, I don't recommend that. Uh, I like vegetables. We eat a lot of vegetables. Um, we eat a lot of meat, too. But... Even if you were to forego all plant life and all fruit life, that cow that you're eating is eating the grass that comes out of the ground that was cursed. So there's, there's no place that we can go to escape this curse that God has placed on everything outside of getting saved and becoming born again. Now, turn to Deuteronomy chapter 32. Deuteronomy chapter 32. And let's look at verses 46 and 47. You know, when I first got saved, I kind of shied away from the Old Testament because it was really big and it was really thick. And everybody told me it was so dry and dusty. So when I first got saved, I didn't spend a whole lot of time in the Old Testament because everybody told me you had to be really smart to understand it. Um, so I just kind of stayed away from it. But then after I stopped listening to people who had my best intentions at heart, I started to read the Old Testament for myself. And the Old Testament's a wild ride. There's some crazy stuff going on here. Um, the Old Testament is never dull, never dry, and never dusty. The only people who think that are the people who don't read it, and they believe that because somebody told them that to stop them from reading it. Um, Deuteronomy 32, verses 46 and 47, well, 45. And Moses made an end of speaking all these words to all Israel, and he said unto them, now here's Moses, he's talking to the Jews. Paul's our leader, Moses is not our leader. We're Gentiles, we're Christians, we're not Jews, we're not spiritual Jews, we're Gentiles. And we don't live in Israel, we're not waiting for the kingdom of heaven, we're in the kingdom of God already. But listen to what Moses says to the Jews, and think of how it might apply to me and you here and now. And he said unto them, verse 46, set your hearts unto all the words which I testify among you this day. Uh, podcasting is very popular now. And we were podcasting going back to 2011. Nobody called it that. We just called it a radio program. Uh, and then a couple of years ago, everybody says, oh, you got to start a podcast. I'm like, that's what I did in 2011. 
<laughs> but now it's called a podcast and everybody has a podcast. Um, and even a lot of the people from the news are quitting their news jobs, like Chris Matthews over at MSNBC. Uh, who else? Megyn Kelly, she quit her news job. She started a podcast. And everybody has an opinion, some good, some bad. Everybody has something to say, some good, some bad. But the point is, you have the world's most popular podcaster, Joe Rogan, has 100 million followers, listeners. He has more listeners than CNN, MSNBC, ABC, CBS, and NBC all put together one man in a microphone from the back of his house. That's the day and age that we live in. Everybody has an opinion. Everybody's talking. Some of it's truth, some of it's nonsense, and it's all mixed up together. But Moses says, set your hearts unto all the words which I testify among you this day. If I wanted to find these words that Moses spoke 4,000 years ago, where would I go to find them? I just read them. They're right here. They're preserved, right? He says, set your hearts unto all the words uh, which I testify among you this day, which ye shall come which ye shall command your children to observe, to do all the words of this law, for it is not a vain thing for you. And if you have a paper Bible, underline those next couple of words, because it is your life. What's at stake with the words of God? Your life. Now, if you're saved... Ephesians chapter 1 and Ephesians uh, chapter 4 say that you have been sealed unto the day of redemption. You could walk out of here, become a serial killer, and the, you die in a hail of bullets by the SWAT team, you're still going to go to heaven. Saved and sealed unto the day of redemption. But Paul says, only use not your liberty for all the things that take you away from God. And Moses, all the way back in Deuteronomy, he says, hey man, I have the words of God. You saw me up on the mountain. You heard the thunder. You saw the ground open up. You saw the people get swallowed. You've seen all the amazing things that God is doing with me for you. So you better pay attention and you better listen because these words that I'm going to give my life for, it's your life. That's how important these words are. It is your life. For it is not a vain thing for you because it is your life. And through this thing, the words of God, ye shall prolong your days in the land whither ye go over Jordan to possess it. You get all the way to the New Testament. Paul's talking to the Corinthians. And he says, hey, why are so many of you sick? Why are so many of you sleeping, dead? Because you didn't discern the body of Christ. That's what Paul says for us. It's really the same thing that Moses said. He said, hey, these words that I have, Jesus says these words that I speak unto you, they are life, right? The entire first chapter of the Gospel of John, and the Word was made flesh, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and He dwelt among us, and we beheld His, his, his uh, glory, and He's full of truth and grace, and all that stuff that you read about, it is your life. There is nothing more important than these words, and according to um, Psalm chapter 90, there is nothing more important than understanding the time that you have been given. Nothing more important than that. Uh, turn to Colossians chapter 3, and we are almost done. Colossians chapter 3, and let's look at verses 1 through 4. Colossians chapter 3, starting in verse 1. If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth 
on the right hand of God. Set your affections on things above, not on things on the earth. For ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, Moses said about the words of God, because it is your life. You know what your life is if you're saved today? Your life is Jesus Christ. That's what Paul says. That's what Moses said. For ye are dead and your life is hid with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. Mortify, therefore, your members upon the earth, fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, covetousness, which is idolatry. For which things sake the wrath of God cometh on the children of disobedience, in the which ye also walked um, some time when ye lived in them. But now ye also put off all these, anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy communication out of your mouth. Lie not one to another, seeing that you have put off the old man with his deeds and have put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. Hebrews 9.27 says this, For it is appointed unto man once to die, and then cometh the judgment. Now you might say to me, well, what about Lazarus? He was a good friend of Jesus Christ, and the Lord raised him spectacularly from the dead. Can you imagine if you were friends with Mary and Martha uh, in Bethany, In John chapter 12, we see Mary with the um, alabaster box. But can you imagine if you were friends with Mary and Martha and Lazarus and you just happened to be wandering by uh, mourning the death of your friend and Jesus says, Lazarus, come forth. Now he's, Bible says he is bound from head to toe with grave clothes. He's like a mummy. And when he came forth, he wasn't loosed. He was still wrapped because Jesus said, loose him. How did he come forth? Flying through the air, hovering like a little low-flying UFO, standing there wrapped like a mummy, a picture of in Adam all die, but in Christ shall all be made alive. And Jesus says, he's alive, unwrap him. Moses said to the people, because it is your life. And so there is nothing more important than we, that we can do as Christians to redeem the time, whatever the amount of time is that we have left. And nobody knows how much any single one of us could be gone today or tomorrow. Um, Somebody once said that you're not promised tomorrow. Well, you're also not promised to the end of today either. Every single moment that you're alive, it is on borrowed time. There is no, you don't have time. All you have is the time that God has allotted you. But in all these Bible promises that I gave you, just a few of them this morning, in all these different pieces of Scripture, God is promising that if we will revere these words the way that we're supposed to, if we will seek after the wisdom of God, if we would put this book in the proper position and place that it deserves in our life, then God's going to do the amazing thing. He setteth up kings, he removeth kings. He changeth the times and the seasons. When we pray, I can't tell you how many times that we have prayed for somebody on our NTEB prayer list and they had an impossible situation and there was no way that that could work out from a human perspective. And sometimes people will say to me and Lori, could you put this on the prayer list? And we look at what the prayer is and it's like, wow. (laughs) Yeah, we'll pray for that, but Lord, how's that ever gonna happen? And we have seen time and time again, God orders and reorders because he's outside of time. If you picture from the Garden of Eden 
all the way to the start of eternity from Genesis 1 to Revelation 22. Picture the whole thing like a loaf of Italian bread and go all the way back to the left side of it. That's year number one. Go all the way to the right side of that loaf of of bread. And that is the end of time. That's Revelation 20. The heaven and the earth explode. They, They fled away. God's holding that loaf of bread. He is outside of all of that. He has already seen how it all works out, how every prayer is answered, how everything is configured. And you know what God will do? The Bible says this, if ye then being evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give them, give to them uh, those that love him? And when we pray and we, when we say, Lord, I wasted 10 years, I wasted 20 years, I wasted 30 years, whatever the amount of time is, if there was no way for us to redeem that time, God wouldn't tell us to do that. But he says, redeem that time because the days are evil. And the only way that I know how to redeem the time is you got to get down on your face you got to get down on your hands and knees and say, Lord, here it is. You work it out. I will put these words in their proper place. I will give them the respect that they deserve by reading them, memorizing as much as I can. Thy word have I hidden my heart that I might not sin against thee and absorbing as much of this word as I possibly can. And then when you do that, amazing things happen, things begin to change. And just like in a a very exciting football game, World Series, uh, World Series Baseball, Super Bowl, you get down to the last play of the fourth quarter, 15 seconds to go, and a miracle happens. God is willing to do that miracle. Don't focus on the amount of time you have left. Don't focus on the amount of time you may or may not have wasted. But commit your cause to the Him, to the one that controls time. And ask Him to work it out for His glory and for your good. Heavenly Father God, we thank You, Lord, for Your goodness and Your mercy. We thank You, Father God, for for everything that was said and done today. And uh, Lord, we do want to redeem the time. We know that the days are evil, and we ask you to work and move as only you can. Um, Lord, we just pray that when this is put online, if there's anyone listening to this message that's not saved, that something was said and done that would lead that lost soul to you. And Lord, for those of us that are saved, Lord, we pray that something was said and done uh, to get us stirred up, to get us on fire for you, to redeem whatever time we have left. And uh, we just thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.